My name is Patsy or Patricia Harmon. Uh, I live in Morgantown, West Virginia. I'm a nurse midwife. I've been a nurse midwife since 1985. I've worked in many, many settings. I've worked in a private practice. I've been a home birth midwife. Um, I've worked in tertiary care centers. I've been on faculties of nursing schools and faculties of medical schools teaching residents and interns and family medicine doctors about normal birth. I love teaching but I also love working with women and I'm not delivering babies now and that's a little bit sad for me but it gives me time to write just for the history of it about 2006 I think there was a medical malpractice crisis and pretty much across the country but very bad in West Virginia and in many rural states the price of medical malpractice insurance doubled and since I'm in practice with my husband who's an OBGYN um, we looked at the numbers and we just couldn't do it. We'd have to do 40 deliveries a month to pay for the medical malpractice insurance. So we gave up delivering babies and we just do women's health and infertility and OB. But the good news is, and people always go, oh, that's so sad. You know, because after 30 years, you're getting good at your job. And I had the ideal partner to work with, which was my husband. We could even discuss cases in bed. and. Um, he had had his babies at home, so I mean, how good does it get for a midwife backup doctor um, that you really have, you're on the same page? And he's an excellent surgeon, so if we needed C-sections, we could always do that. Around that time, I was going through menopause, and I had time that I would wake up at night and start thinking about the patients, and that's how I wrote my first book. So the bad news is, 30 years of delivering babies, you're really good at it. But the good news is now I can write about midwives and, and midwifery and um, my latest book was a novel so I'm branching out, but she's a midwife. <laughs> well, the first one was called The Blue Cotton Gown. It references the gown that you wear in the exam room and you feel naked and you are naked. And when people talk to me, they're very open about um, maybe it's my manner or maybe people just women need to talk I'm not sure but one of the questions I always ask is how's your stress level and then people will get a little look in their eye and maybe look down you say what and then they begin to tell their stories and I would walk out of that room after 20 minutes or a half an hour almost stunned with some of the stories that people would tell me about their lives so that book is really about the courage of ordinary women and um, People don't write about that very much. It's not so much about childbirth, but the other things that midwives do besides delivering babies. So it reads like a novel, but it's all true, and of course the names and everything, everybody's been changed, and I had to get the people read their chapters and say it was all right, and not one person said no, which was really touching to me, because I said, you're more important to me than the book, and if you don't want to be in it, I so totally understand. And one person who even lost her, her daughter to a drug overdose, I, she was the one I worried the most about. And she said, if it will help somebody else not be alone, I want it to be in there. So that was really touching. And then I had to write another book because people kept asking me, well, I don't get it. How come you're like this big professional, you know, doctor, midwife, nurse midwife team. How did you get from your home birthdays to that? So the next book was called uh, Arms Wide Open, A Midwife's Journey. And it goes back to the 70s when I used to be really radical and live in communes and we built our own houses out of logs and drugged the logs out of the, the woods. You know, we were just really earthy. Nowadays they call it sustainable, but you know, we didn't have that name yet. But we were, we cared about the environment and that was partly why we chose to live like that. Uh, but it kind of documents my journey from being a home birth midwife and they didn't have CPMs or anything like that. You were just called a lay midwife uh, to eventually going back to school and becoming an RN and then like I told you, you know, really worked in all kinds of settings. And the third book is a novel called The Midwife of Hope River and it's set in the 1930s and it's about a midwife who tells you in the first chapter, she's 36, has already been a widow twice, is too old and too obstinate for courting and not only that, she's wanted in two states. So <laughs> people ask me, is it more fun to write the memoirs of the nonfiction or the fiction? And I would have to say the fiction is more fun because first of all, you don't have to worry about hurting anyone's feelings or privacy issues. You're making these people up. 
the books are really well received and the last one's going to be published in nine countries which is pretty cool and I think it says something about the rise of midwifery right now uh, worldwide that people publishers see this as a market they're you know they're capitalizing on it but they must think there's readers you know so it'll be in Japan and Sweden and Norway and Great Britain and all these countries where there are midwives. I do a lot of public speaking for the book and you know, I, there's a few years ago I thought about getting my doctorate. Because I'm smart, you know, I could do that. But then I thought, you can't write books and get your doctorate. Or you could, but you'd be a crazy woman, right? And I want to I want to enjoy life a little bit. So I decided just to stick with the writing. But because of that, I do a lot of speaking. And I, you know, get to go to bookstores and, you know, book groups. And I always talk about midwifery and the state of obstetrics in the United States and why people choose to have babies at home um, and, um, you know, what the trends are and worldwide that 80% of babies are born into the hands of midwives and in this country 10%. But it's growing, I always say. Writing has always been easy for me. I'm not like my husband, for example. He would agonize over every sentence. I just write like I talk. And then I go back and edit and you know try to make it more beautiful and things like that. I wrote uh, journals, I wrote poetry. In the 70s and 80s I wrote for kind of a political rag, you know. I had a, a pen name, Trillium Stone. Can you believe that? But if people say, was that because you didn't want people to know who you were? No, it was because our staff was so small that we needed more writers. So we would make up names, like one article might be Patsy Harmon and the other one would be Trillium Stone. So it was a kind of an environmental, political uh, little newspaper. And this is when I lived in Duluth. And then I wrote a few articles in journal research and stuff when I was more in my academic part of my career. And how I started writing, I, I guess I told you that, right? I was going through menopause and I, I was just so struck by these stories. And after a while I realized, you know, this could be a book. Women are interested in other women and what we're going through. And some men have read it, but it's, it's basically a woman's book. One of the problems for me in being a writer, I also still work part-time. I work in the office three days a week. I have lots of books and I buy books and people give me books. But when I have free time, I want to write. <laughs> so then people tell me about all these great books and I feel bad. Oh, I haven't read that yet. You know? And it's fun, especially the novel. I'm working on a, a trilogy about the Hope River. People come up to me and say, oh, I didn't want that book to end. Are you going to write another one? I go, yeah, let me tell you about it. And I start to tell them. And it's like these characters are real. And we're all standing around like, so what happened? And I don't even know yet because I haven't finished the book. But it's just, it's fun. It's really, it is really fun. And especially the, the last one, The Midwife of Hope River, I was able to uh, bring in a lot of ideas about birth and transformation um, and forgiveness, things like that, that um, that are like they're teaching to, to me I'm still teaching you know the last book especially is is more popular like I'm, I'm in the market so people who aren't that maybe they just want a historical novel but they don't know about midwives but now they do you know that is such a good question and it amazes me myself so I start off with an idea about the general idea of the midwife, maybe she's a radical, because I've been a radical, although the setting is different, it's a different time period. And then the door opens. I don't even know who's standing there, but I see it's a man. It's snowing outside. He's calling the midwife. They need her in Hazel Patch. So it just goes from there. What's it like when she's on her, her burrow trying to get to this place in Hazel Patch, you know? What's she going to see? And he tells her, the baby's arm is coming out first. The old black midwife doesn't know what to do. What happens when she gets there? We don't know. So that's how it goes. Such ripe material for writing or for film. And I've thought about this, because what we do as midwives is, and there's even a line in um, The Midwife of Hope River where patience, the midwife says to the sheriff, midwives are warriors. And I love that line. And for a profession, you know, other than being a soldier or a lawman or something, we're at the cusp of life and death. 
we're standing right there, you know, with our gentle hands, but warriors. And, and I think that statement stands for a lot of what a lot of the other people in midwifery have done, these political types. They are warriors. They're in Washington, D.C., knocking on doors for women and babies. You know, I've thought about what makes the difference between a nurse midwife or, or, or a midwife or a nurse, and I think some of it is courage. You have to be very brave for many reasons. If you're a home birth midwife, you're definitely brave, right? You're out there, you know things could happen. Hopefully you've got your bases covered if there's an emergency, but you know that you're standing there between life and death. It's great for writing. There's always, you know, exciting things that you can write about and it would be great for film. Well, I just think we're really, we're friends, we're lovers and we're colleagues, you know, and we share this uh, passion, I guess, for healthcare and, and helping people. And, you know, when we were uh, more politically ra radical, it was during the war in Vietnam, you know, he was a, a conscientious objector and we were involved with a group called Peacemakers that were nonviolent activists. And I lived in New England for a while um, and protested and, you know, we've both been in jail and these stories I haven't even tried to talk about, um, not because they're painful, but I feel like sometimes, you know, you can milk your own life. <laughs> you start to feel like, is this narcissistic or is this something people really want to hear about, you know? <laughs> so it's a good relationship. I mean, if you ever do read my books, you'll find out, you know, it's, like, it's got some bumpy roads like any marriage, you know. We really, really like working together, so, um, and we've done it for so many years, you know, even in the commune days, you know, we would be out there, you know, planting corn or fruit trees or building houses together, and now we work in the same office. People say, oh, I could never work with my husband, but they have to realize it's not like we're glued at the arm here. He has exam room seven, eight, and nine, and I work in exam room one and two, and they're on the opposite side of the clinic. So I might see him three times a day, and it's usually when I have a question, or if I bring him a cup of tea because I know he's tired, or something like that. So it's not like um, I don't know what people think working with their husband would be like. You know that you're on each other's nerves or something like that. Tom used to, he was a, an EMT, and he would drive me to the deliveries like in the fog or the bad weather, and so he was there for home births, and I think that makes him a really a special physician, um, you know, that he saw birth in the most normal environment, and so he knows that that's possible, and it should be actually common, and it's not. For a long time, he backed up home birth doctors, I mean, not doctors, but midwives, but he hasn't been doing that lately because he doesn't have privileges at the hospital for that. So he couldn't do a C-section unless another doctor was doing one and he could assist. He does assist other doctors. And you know what's interesting? I have three boys and not no girls, so I'm not going to probably get to deliver my grandbabies. I have other midwife friends who have delivered their own daughters babies and stuff. I'm probably not going to do that. It's funny because their attitude about birth is so like, well, of course my wife would breastfeed. And we're like, well, it actually is up to her, you know. <laughs> and the guys are just like, oh, of course, you know. They just think, you know, babies pop out or something because, you know, since they're four years old or something, they've just known where babies come from or maybe two, probably two. They were all at each other's births, you know, except for the youngest. You know, I think we always were oriented to, to what was natural. You know, we grew our own food. We wanted to live lightly on the earth. It just made sense that you would want to have your babies in the most gentle, normal way you could. And in the 1970s, and, and some people are astounded to hear these things, but literally there was nowhere you could have your father, the father of the baby with you. Um, you were always in stirrups, and I don't mean just the little kind with your feet, the, the kind where your legs are up like this, um, on your back with your hands literally strapped. And the nurses would always say, oh, I'm just going to tie it lightly, honey. But does it matter if it's tight or light? You're flat on your back. The baby was taken away immediately. I mean, none of that made sense to us. So we tried to find a midwife back in, it would have been 70, um, and there in, I lived in Minnesota then, and the only midwife was an older lady in Minneapolis, and she would not leave Minneapolis, and we lived in Duluth. That first baby was born in the hospital, and we found a little hospital north of Duluth that uh, would let us uh, do things kind of our way. We went to Lamaze classes. We took the Greyhound. We didn't have a car, so we took the Greyhound bus. Um, 
six times to Minneapolis to go to these classes. I don't even remember where we stayed. I mean, if we because they have them at night, so we must have had friends or somebody we could stay with back and forth six times. And um, the birth was a, a good experience, long, hard labor, back labor. But after that, I began to teach childbirth classes. All this is in Arms Wide Open, the second book. It was from there that once we moved to West Virginia to the commune, um, people began to ask me to come to their births. It's astounding to me that I would think that you know, could just read a book and go deliver a baby. But that's how I thought of it. And then after a while, I was able to find an apprenticeship in Austin, Texas, that would let me come there. And I delivered probably 10, maybe 12 babies with them. And this is interesting, because it turns out this co-op of midwives in Austin, Texas, had been trained by a nurse midwife who left the state and wanted there to be somebody left there who could do home births. So when I finally did go to midwifery school, nurse midwifery school, I felt like it wasn't that foreign to me. Sterile technique, all the stuff that I had learned in Austin was from a nurse midwife. Isn't that kind of neat? And I think, you know, if I tried, I could probably find out who she was. She's probably gone by now, but I just think that would be interesting to see if you could figure out who she was, because she'd be like my foremother, right? I'd probably delivered babies in the home for, you know, maybe seven years or something like that. And what made me want to become a nurse midwife was not anything scary. Nothing happened that made me think a oh, home birth isn't safe, I want to work in a hospital, nothing like that. It was really that I wanted to be of service to more women because I was so strict about who I would help at home. They had to be healthy. Um, you know, and I had such a low risk population. It was all these women that were building their own log houses, eating all organic food, dragging the logs out of the woods. I mean, where would you get that pop? And believed in themselves, believed they could do it, which is probably more important than all those other things. I got a job for, uh, it was a part time job working for Community Action. And um, it was to go into the homes of the poor and teach sewing, nutrition, and budgeting. <laughs> well, I got around to the sewing and nutrition, but I never got to the budgeting because I'm no good at it anyway. <laughs> I, w I didn't even start with the budgeting. But these were women who had already shown an interest in improving their, their families' lives. So in terms of impoverished people, they were kind of the cream of the crop of people who wanted to better themselves. But I would go to their homes, and they were places that looked like out of the book, my Appalachia. And this is 1970, not 1930. And they would tell me their birth stories because, like you, I was always interested in, you know, women's things and birth stories. And I would meet these people who had been sterilized against their will, people, you know, of all, all kinds of things that had happened to them. And I thought, you know, these women deserve a gentle, respectful birth as well as my wonderful hippie friends. By that time my practice was broadening, you know, I would be getting some Jehovah Witness and people of all walks of life, local West Virginians, not necessarily the hippie homesteaders that had moved to West Virginia for the cheap land. And so that's kind of why I thought I would like to be a nurse midwife because I might have to practice in a hospital. I didn't even think about being a nurse midwife at home. I just assumed to get a job or whatever I would go and work in the hospital. And also those people are not good risk candidates for home birth, you know. They're just not, a lot of people really poor nutrition. And those same people are, you know, in West Virginia as many places, they're still there, you know. And in West Virginia, you could drive through on the freeway and think it looked like any place because there's the same fast food restaurants, the same service stations, people look pretty affluent, the cars aren't bad. All you have to do is go three miles off in any direction and you're back in my Appalachia, places that you would think people wouldn't live. But you know, there's so many good values too and one of the neat things about West Virginia in terms of prenatal care is the young women do not miss their visits. Like I've talked to people say from New Orleans or you know the Bay Area where they're working with poor urban women and the family is so fractured that and a lot of drugs and things like that which there are in West Virginia too. So people will come for one prenatal visit and then show up at the hospital and they have high blood pressure by now or some you know bad complication. In West Virginia, people come. It doesn't matter if it's in a battered old pickup or what. Grandpa will bring them. And, and it's, it, the family still really values health care and they, 
value babies, I guess, you know. And there's that structure there. Uh, people in, who grew up in West Virginia don't leave there very much. You know, even college-educated people don't want to leave. And sometimes I think, that's dumb. You can go to Pittsburgh and get a job. In West Virginia, you might be working at a restaurant with a degree in finance or something, you know, waiting tables because they don't want to leave. It's pretty neat in a way. I mean, I, I could see it both ways. I can see, like, well, you're not going to move ahead in your life if you don't take some chances. But yet their love for their family is impressive, I think. I learned about sick people. <laughs> <laughs> because the basics of obstetrics aren't that hard, but when you get to work with more high-risk patients, then you start seeing patterns of illness and preterm labor and all that kind of stuff. And I enjoy learning. I mean, any kind of learning is fun for me. So, um, you know, that's kind of what I learned. And then I learned some bad stuff about what you can do to birth by messing it up, you know, with our interventions. You know, my goal was to take care of all kinds of people, and um, so I was able to do that. I like teaching, I like teaching residents and uh, interns, and even OBGYNs about normal birth and, and about midwifery and midwives, so I wouldn't say it was all bad. I did it for 20 years. I actually loved it, really. It is funny, isn't it, that you think, well, why do we bother getting our masters in midwifery if you could just go get Varney's midwifery or Miles midwifery and study up. <laughs> but I'm not saying it was a, a great thing to do. I mean, you know, I, I, you could say I was lucky or you could say I screened very, very carefully and learned from other midwife stories. You know. We had a collective of midwives and Sarita was one of the people in there um, of home birth midwives and we would meet maybe quarterly and share stories. And I miss that, you know, I miss that at these conventions. It's all very scientific now, you know. Uh, research and all that, instead of people saying, well, I had this woman in the tub and I had her flipped her over on her hands and knees and I couldn't see what was coming so I just put my hand down there and it was a butt. I heard this story last night. <laughs> Fortunately, I mean, can you picture delivering a breech baby in the bathtub on her hands and knees? I'd be like, okay. <laughs> How do you do this? I mean, I know how to do a breach, but how do you do one upside down in a tub? Anyway, she, the midwife told me the baby just shot right out, so that was good. Well, again, partly because I had my husband, I think it's much harder if you work with a physician group or an academic faculty or something that doesn't see birth as a normal event. So even when I was in the teaching hospitals. I guess not so much at Case Western because he was still a resident. He didn't go back to medical school till he was 30. So there I, I guess it was a little harder, but at WVU uh, he was my backup. So, you know, I could have women walk. I wouldn't have to have them on the monitors. They wouldn't have to have IVs. They could get in the water. I mean, so as best you can, you could isolate yourself in a hospital and still have a normal birth. It wasn't the same as home, but pretty close. And I will say, and I know this isn't the topic, there was something about Tom that's really cool and that he's very calm. And even like say in, a woman was failing to progress or something and needed help with the vacuum or even a C-section, he always had a way of coming in and it's just not like, here I am, I'm the doctor, I'm going to save the day, boy are you lucky I'm here. He would come in and say, so do you need some help? What's going on? You know, and so respectful for me, but of the patient, you know, that they had been trying hard and they were getting tired or whatever. That was really, it's a neat thing, you know. I like that. This sounds odd to say, but I do think my writing and talking about midwifery is probably the most fun. And that sounds weird because how fun could delivering, I mean, delivering babies is, fun, it's really fun, but to be able to inspire people, inspire other midwives, inspire patients and just general readers, I mean, I think that that it would be the highlight, really, of my career. It's funny, I don't think of it as a career exactly, but, you know. Well, it's a wonderful job being a midwife. I mean, I, even in the, in the office, in the clinic, I mean, what kind of job do you get eight or ten hugs a day? 
I mean, that's, isn't that incredible? You know, you know, I initiate a lot of hugs, but I get them back too. And you think, what other job would you do this? And why would you want to quit? Now, being up all night, there is a certain point where a lot of us do quit. You know, it gets to be hard on you. But um, ours wasn't for that. But, you know, now that I think about it, would I go back to being up all night? Ah, uh, it'd be hard for me. It's a wonderful job. It's interesting. I was talking to somebody uh, yesterday about the transformative power of birth. And we were talking, I was talking about how it can transform a woman, you know, to learn about your own power, to go through pain. A lot of people don't believe in that, but you go through pain and you come out stronger. And there may be a function in, in that to make people more spiritual or just maybe physically stronger, I don't know. But there's also transformation in the midwife, I think. The person who gets to be there and gets to see that. And also, like I said, we have to be brave, you know. So maybe that's where some of that light comes from, I don't know. And you know, it's sad to me in, in a way, and this is probably off your topic, but just I see a lot of young people, my kids included, who don't have a vocation, a calling. You have one, you know, you found one. But a lot of younger people don't, and it's considered like okay to work your whole life in a job you don't particularly like. You know, so yeah, I'm really lucky. You have to say it's a gift, really. Well, and you know, I talk to my patients about that. You know, what I say first of all, I said don't get in bed until you absolutely have to. Stay out of bed because the pain will not be that bad for you if you have a normal length labor. If you have a really long, long, exhausting labor, there's a place for pain medicine and epidurals and things like that. But you know, if you get by with a 10, 12 hour labor, maybe that sounds long, but you're not in pain every minute. You get a break in between and then you have a contraction. And I think if you have support and you have opportunity to move around, maybe get in the water, you'll be surprised that the pain is not as bad as you thought. There'll get to be a point where you'll say, I want out, I can't do this anymore, and you know what? You probably got an hour or half an hour more, and then the baby's starting to come. And once that happens, you don't care about the pain anymore. So if you were my patients, that's what, that's what I would tell you. The best birthing plan I ever got was from the, a person who was not that educated. And I said to her, so do you have a birthing plan? And she said, well, I just want to go as natural as I can stand it. And I thought, that's a good birthing plan. Just go for it, you know, until maybe you can't stand it. And then the baby's probably going to come. I just think being upright and stuff like that is so important for moving things, you know, moving them along. And that's the kind of tragedy of, of how we manage labor nowadays is so many people are hooked up to everything. You know, they've got the monitor on, they've got the IV on. In some hospitals you have to have a pulse ox on your finger. So, I mean, it's like robot woman. You've got all the wire. Oh, and then you've got an internal monitor maybe, you know, inside. So, I mean, that's really sad to me and that, that really takes a person's power away. You know, things have gone well for me politically and professionally, partly because I have the doctor, you know, along my side. I think my biggest regrets are family. And I, I don't know if other midwives would say this, but you get so attached or involved with your patients that sometimes I think you're not as tuned in, say, to your own kids. I mean, I think I was a pretty good mom, but if I if I were to do anything else, I remember we talked about it as being a vocation or calling, and absolutely that was true with me. But I think sometimes I took my parenting more for granted, that I could fly by the seat of my pants, do whatever I wanted, and my kids would all be fine. And I think if you ask them, there were things that they missed. Not so much like, oh, mom didn't come to my baseball game, but mom might not have been fully present at all the times that she should have been. If I had to talk to younger midwives, um, I would say be careful, you know, be careful, caring, you know, full of caring for your family. And I guess taking care of yourself would be important too, and I was never great at that. You know, somehow I survived, but I, that was at the bottom of my, <laughs> my list, is taking care of myself, you know. I'll take care of my patients and my kids and maybe my husband a little bit, and then me. <laughs> This is between you and I as moms, but I guess I thought that because my husband and I both had a passionate vocation that the kids would 
get that as well by osmosis or something so that it was okay. It was okay that dad and I are like going back to school and working long hours and doing all this stuff while you're a little kid that that, that would make your life better in some ways, but I'm not sure that works, you know, really not sure that works. But still, I think if you have a calling, you have to go, you know. Well, that's a hard question, but I think I've talked a little bit about it. I think courage, and I don't know if other people would say that, but I think courage and love are a love of your patience. I think those are the two things that are the heart for me. And belief, I guess, that belief in, in the natural process, believing in that we're made to give birth, you know, women are made to give birth. And, and like I said about the poor women, that women, families deserve gentle respect. And I'll keep writing about midwifery and, and birth and transformation. And hope, you know, I thought about the, the common theme between my three books, um, and I think what it is is hope. You know, how, no matter how bleak things may seem in our lives at different times, that there's always hope.